and we should be turning out you know, very well-trained people to do this work because people's lives are at stake. But what happens is when they're part of the law enforcement organizational structure, they're often looked at as fellow officers. You know, we arrest them and you help us convict them. And we shouldn't have political pressure or social pressure interfering with science. Science should be the thing that we focus on here. And uh, unfortunately, you know, there's a guy named Fred Zane in West Virginia. Remember him? He had dozens and dozens of people that he convicted. And, and they used to say, boy, you know, no one can make this case. And all of a sudden, Fred would waltz in and Fred would make the case. Somebody else just overlooked things. Well, it turned out he made up the stuff. He'd go testify very persuasively that the laboratory evidence showed this guy did it. He made it up. So we got to have better quality control. Uh, the adversarial system, let me just talk about a couple of things and then we'll uh, turn it over to you for some questions. Um, as I mentioned, the adversarial system makes the assumption that both sides are presenting their cases very aggressively and, and effectively, but in all too many cases that just doesn't happen. And both of, if you look at the, uh, what we call the continental inquisitorial system in most of Europe outside of uh, Great Britain, they don't use the adversarial system. But they, for example, investigations will be carried out under the supervision of a magistrate. And when they're doing the investigation, they're looking for the facts wherever they lead, for the defense or for the prosecution. They're doing the investigation for the court, unlike what we do here. So uh, if they find something favorable to defense, they, they turn it over to the court. And here, too many times here, it gets suppressed and not turned over to, to, the, uh, to the defense. So there's an emphasis here on process um, in the adversarial system as opposed to simple truth finding. Um, that becomes painfully clear when people get wrongfully convicted and want to make a case that they're actually innocent, but they find out that they're not going to have any basis for appeal because there were no procedural violations. So imagine this. We've, we've now created a situation where we have no tolerance for procedural violations but we have great tolerance for the wrong outcome. <laughs> you can be innocent and good luck unless you can show some procedural violation. But what if you didn't have any procedural violations and you're still innocent and you were convicted? Well, in the adversarial system, I think it's one of our Achilles heel. A uh, um, humorous story is told to illustrate this point um, with respect to the British system, which is also adversarial. A frustrated English judge had just finished listening to conflicting witness accounts when the judge turned to the barrister, the lawyer, and said, am I never to hear the truth? And the barrister said, no, my lord, merely the evidence. <laughs> and so all too often that's the case. And so both sides have their, their defenders. The adversarial people say that's the only way truth's going to emerge. You, gotta have, you can't have any conflict of interest. The two sides have to be independent. And the other side is saying, well, but geez. Um, I don't know, you, 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 the adversarial system doesn't seem to give a fair break sometimes. Well, some recent developments include the Innocence Protection Act of 2003, which is now sitting in Congress. Um, it has a lot of uh, sponsors, the primary one, Senator Patrick Leahy from Vermont, but it's bipartisan. It's got uh, 240, let's see, 31 senators and 246 members of the House are now co-sponsors. This would ensure that convicted offenders are given the chance to prove their innocence through DNA testing, help the states provide competent legal services at every stage of every death penalty prosecution, enable those who can prove their innocence to recover compensation, um, and provide the public with more reliable and detailed information regarding the administration of capital punishment. Um, Leahy said, and I'll just say a little bit about what he said, if we put ourselves in the place of those who are wrongly convicted, we surely would act. A year may not seem like a long time on Capitol Hill, but it is an eternity for someone sitting wrongfully convicted in a death row prison cell. For every wrongfully convicted person on death row, there is a true killer who may still be on the streets. Yay, Senator Leahy got the point. <laughs> it's a public safe. The parade of wrongfully convicted people being released from death row undermines public confidence in our system of justice. That's another thing I've been saying for 15 years. If we find out we have made all these errors, juries are going to become more reluctant to convict. Look at the O.J. Simpson trial. 
I suggest to you if that trial had taken place in Santa Monica, filed in Santa Monica, it probably would have had a different outcome. It could have well had a different outcome. One reason why, the people on that jury did not trust the LAPD. The LAPD had a bad relationship with the citizens. They were distrustful. They were ready to believe that they were framing him, that they were manipulating evidence. Other juries in different parts of the city might not. And you notice the big perceptional, the difference in perception between African Americans and whites during that trial. African Americans generally thought he was innocent. Whites generally thought he was guilty. And a lot of that has to do with experiences with law enforcement and criminal justice. I actually think if we can reduce the number of errors that we make, it'll result in a higher probability of convictions. Because the juries won't worry that you're producing tainted evidence. They will be, tend to believe you more and have more credibility. We talked about the Innocence Project, um, and they're now trying to set up uh, Innocence Projects around the, around the country, one of them here in Kentucky, I understand. There are also Innocence Commissions. There's one in Great Britain, and I think we should look at what they're doing. I've, I'm trying to propose right now with a colleague in Britain an evaluation of the British Criminal Cases Review Commission. The last data I got from Great Britain, this is a, um, a national level commission that looks at cases. They had 3,680 appeals. They had reviewed 2,381. Of those, they referred only 203 cases, or 4%, back to the courts of appeal where they said there might be a problem with these cases. Of those 203 cases, 49 had so far been heard. The others are still pending. 38 convictions were overturned. So the 38 convictions represented 77% of the cases referred to the commission, but only 1.6% of all of the appeals. Remember my initial estimate, half a 1% error? Turns out now at this conference I just was at in Switzerland, the German scholars have come up with about the same estimate, of about 1%. Several studies now, plus the British experience, looks like somewhere around 1% is not a bad estimate. Then finally, there's the death penalty. And you know, everybody's got their own opinion about the death penalty. The, the majority of Americans still support the death penalty. We are increasingly isolated in the world. Um, people have abandoned it in the, the Western world, except for us. And many people get into theological debates about it or whatever. I always tell my students, you know what? To me, um, here's, it's pretty simple for me. Convictions are generally based on a probability of guilt and not a certainty of guilt. We say at the trial, guilty beyond reasonable doubt. We don't know for sure. We know that some of these people are innocent because we're finding out that they're innocent. So in my opinion, all sentences should be reversible if we discover error. And guess what? All of them are, except the death penalty. What do you do if you've killed the person? You compensate their estate? But if we have them in prison and we find out we made a mistake, we can let them out and give them some compensation. There'll never be enough. I worked on Ohio's compensation statute when I was at Ohio State. It wasn't perfect by any means, but it was a step forward. I sat down with the state attorney general and the public defender. We got an almost unanimous vote from the Ohio legislature, and it's an interesting case study. These were not everybody who was wrongfully convicted, by the way, but those who went to prison and turned out to be innocent. In Ohio, there's a formula. And so the Court of Common Pleas that, convict, that sentenced them has to certify that they didn't do it, they're innocent, or that in fact no crime actually occurred. There have been some cases like that. Then it goes to the Court of Claims in Ohio and they administer the compensation. And what we put in at that point in the 80s was $20,000 per year prorated for every year that you serve, all of your back wages that you would have earned if you had a job when you went to prison, all of your attorney's fees, and you expressly retain civil rights to sue civilly if you were in any way uh, traumatized or brutalized while you 